Good afternoon, everyone, uh, and welcome to the Dole Institute for Politics. Uh, my name is David Hamilton Golland, and I am a I'm an associate professor, soon to be full professor at Governor's State University outside of Chicago, Illinois. Uh, thanks everyone for tuning in during uh, these, uh, I hate to use the word unprecedented because I'm a historian and I can always find precedents, but let's just say these uh, unusual times uh, when we're all at home or we're out um, doing our work as essential um, members of our, our service economy. Thanks to everyone for tuning in. Uh, a couple of uh, special thanks that I'd like to give to Angie Erdley and Zachary Walker, uh, who are uh, working at the Dole Institute and uh, have been uh, very gracious with their time in helping to set this up, as well as the director, Bill Lacey, and Ms. Sarah D'Antonio Gard. Um, Bill is the, as I said, the director, but also uh, Sarah uh, is the person who sets up the uh, the travel funds, and way back in 2011, uh, she helped me out, and uh, that's ultimately what's led me here. She helped me out and she got me some travel funds to visit the Dole Institute and do some research for a book I was working on, which is over my right shoulder right now, A Terrible Thing to Waste, Arthur Fletcher and the Conundrum of the Black Republican. At that point, it was as yet untitled Arthur Fletcher Project, and Arthur Fletcher had the beginning of his political career in Kansas, uh, which is where he may have originally run in to uh, a young Bob Dole in the 1950s. Uh, we know that he and the senator uh, became close at least by the 1970s, um, and, but I could not find any evidence to, of, of an earlier connection when I was there at the, uh, at the archive uh, or in the Fletcher papers themselves. Um, let me talk a little bit about Art Fletcher uh, who he was, um, uh, and I'll, I'll then read a few excerpts from the book, uh, which was published by University Press of Kansas, uh, just down the road from the Dole Institute, um, uh, in 2019, last uh, March, in fact. So Arthur Fletcher was perhaps the most important civil rights leader you've never heard of. I should say probably never heard of. Um, he was uh, born on the uh, proverbial wrong side of the tracks, in the American Southwest uh, near Fort Huachuca, uh, Arizona, was raised uh, in various places in the Southwest, including the Watts section of Los Angeles, Oklahoma City, and then ultimately Junction City, uh, Kansas, uh, as the son of a Buffalo soldier, an African-American soldier who was stationed at Fort Riley, uh, which those of you who are tuning in near the Dole Institute, of course, are well aware is just outside Junction City. Uh, he went on to advise four presidents of the United States, uh, Richard Nixon, um, uh, Gerald Ford, uh, Ronald Reagan, and George H.W. Bush. Uh, the last of these presidents was perhaps uh, Mr. Fletcher's most important uh, political uh, friendship. And uh, just uh, an incredibly colorful life, an incredibly important life. Um, he was known for many, many years as the father of affirmative action enforcement, and that was absolutely his claim to fame uh, during the Nixon administration. And in recent years, a number of scholars have talked about the importance of uh, the Nixon administration to the origins of affirmative action. American society and American public policy. Uh, Arthur Fletcher was the member of the Nixon administration who really pursued that policy, uh, pushed it through to implementation. Um, and uh, he then uh, returned as a special advisor to the White in the White House uh, of President Ford, uh, campaigning in 1976 for President Ford's election. Uh, and uh, his continuing friendship at that point with George H.W. Bush led to a couple of minor appointments during the Reagan administration, but then ultimately the chairmanship of the United States Commission on Civil Rights during the first Bush administration, again, the George H.W. Bush administration. Uh, and so what I'd like to do now is I'd like to just read a little bit from the book, uh, should be a few minutes of it, and then um, I'll open it up to some questions from the audience. Um, there should be a way for you to ask the questions on the Facebook feed, I'm told. I'm gonna to go ahead and click refresh on that and see how that's coming in. Uh, even now while I, while I uh, begin. So uh, here we are. Until recently, Arthur Allen Fletcher, the self-styled father of affirmative action enforcement, 
who helped coin the phrase, a mind is a terrible thing to waste, has been largely left out of treatments on the civil rights era. Most who know the broad outlines of his story have not known quite what to make of this civil rights politician who remained loyal to the Republican Party despite its gradual abandonment of the principles he espoused. The life of Arthur Fletcher represents the triumph, tragedy, and conundrum of the post-war Black Republican. In 1946, when he returned home after World War II, the Republican Party was the party of Lincoln, a big tent truly welcoming of African Americans. In 1960, its presidential platform was stronger on civil rights than that of the Democrats. But the new right conservatism, epitomized by Barry Goldwater's 1964 presidential candidacy and President Richard M. Nixon's Southern strategy, steadily alienated Black voters. Ronald Reagan appealed to unreconstructed white Southerners and the Northern white working class for whom the achievements of the civil rights era represented a loss of privilege. Whereas Fletcher triumphantly implemented affirmative action during the early Nixon administration, his ability to promote civil rights policy tragically eroded in the years that followed, despite his constant loyalty and continued presidential appointments. Since 1980, African Americans who are right of center on issues other than civil rights have faced a conundrum support the Democrats with whom they agree on civil rights but little else, or stick with a Republican party from which they have been steadily alienated. Arthur Fletcher was born in poverty to a single mother in Phoenix, Arizona in 1924, and went on to advise four United States presidents. As I said before, Richard Nixon, Ford, Ronald Reagan, and George H.W. Bush. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> As Assistant Secretary of Labor in the Nixon administration, he implemented the Philadelphia Plan, the first major national affirmative action initiative. He later served as Chairman of the Commission on Civil Rights in the first Bush administration. Along the way, he was wounded in Europe during World War II, advised the legal team for the Brown v. Board case, was the first black player for the Baltimore Colts football team, endured the suicide of his first wife and the disintegration of his family lost a close race for Lieutenant Governor of Washington State while campaigning with former child actress Shirley Temple and employing as his driver the future serial killer Ted Bundy, stared down the Soviet representative to the United Nations on the issue of refuseniks, led the United Negro College Fund through a major transformation, took on Marion Barry in the first open election for mayor of Washington, D.C., and ran for the 1996 Republican presidential nomination to protest the party's abandonment of his signature policy achievement, affirmative action. So I'm going to go ahead and, and skip forward to kind of the heart of the book, what I call the central chapter, chapter four. There are seven, seven chapters, and uh, uh, the, book, the book sort of follows a narrative arc and chapter four is kind of right there at the zenith, if you will. Um, and at this point, um, I'm actually in just after uh, the end of chapter four and the beginning of chapter five. And um, at this point, uh, Art Fletcher has been asked to resign from the Nixon administration. He's had a brief stint on the United Nations delegation where he met George Bush uh, for the first time. And now he is uh, the executive director of the United Negro College Fund in New York. Nixon sent Fletcher off well, becoming the first US president to write a personal check to the United Negro College Fund. Presidential advisor Stanley Scott, now the highest rank in the government, gave him a picture of Nick Nixon shaking hands with Fletcher in the Oval Office, with a note scrawled across the top, quote, to Art, a great guy to have on any team, to your credit, we'll miss you more than you'll miss us. Best personal regards, Stan Scott, the White House, December 1971. Fletcher hit the ground running at United Negro College Fund, delivering fundraising speeches in Atlanta, Omaha, and Philadelphia in his first two months alone. The ex-football player liked to be physically active, and the fund schedule, unlike the UN schedule, didn't usually require attendance at more than one cocktail party or dinner per night. He announced an unprecedented fundraising goal of $50 million by 1975, with a 1972 goal of $12.5 million, an increase of nearly $3 million over 1971. 
This was not chump change. The UNCF, United Negro College Fund, raised funds to help mostly first-generation African-American college students pay their tuition and associated costs, and in doing so assisted the historically Black colleges and universities in their quest to remain relevant and fiscally viable in the post-Jim Crow era, when the most academically talented Black youngsters were expected to attend the newly integrated, formerly all-white schools throughout the South. The amount Fletcher proposed was indeed unprecedented. If realized, it represented nearly a third of all donations since the fund's 1944 founding, which then totaled $120 million. On March 13, 1972, the fund announced its new advertising slogan, A Mind is a Terrible Thing to Waste, which brought the UNCF into newspapers and televisions for the first time and made the organization a household name. The slogan had been in the works for several months. At the end of Vernon Jordan's tenure as head of the United Negro College Fund, the organization had become a client of the Nonprofit Advertising Council, which developed public service announcements and helped the fund secure the pro bono assistance of the prestigious advertising firm Young and Rubicam, who tasked account executive Forrest Long with developing a slogan. When Fletcher assumed his post at the fund, development of the slogan was in its final stages. As Fletcher recounted, quote, Within less than 30 days of starting work at the fund, I was called over to the offices of Young and Rubicam. Once there, I was shown a copy of the ad they wanted me to sign off on. It said, a mind is a hell of a thing to waste. My immediate, my immediate reaction was, that won't fly. Why? Because at the time, the UNCF schools were sponsored by various African-American Christian religious denominations. Therefore, I knew the word hell in an advertisement that was supposed to promote black education would be totally unacceptable. We tossed around a host of words, awful, sad, horrible, stupid, pity, etc., and finally settled on the word terrible and went with it. Young and Rubicam, uh, sorry, unquote, <laughs> Young and Rubicam was ready to launch the slogan. The Ad Council needed Fletcher to start a public campaign explaining it, and Fletcher, as he remembered it, didn't have the time to soothe potential tensions among board members. Quote, I said, you know, you all appointed me to be the executive director. The clock is running, so I didn't do all that internal campaigning, unquote. He filmed the first television commercial ads that summer, and the slogan took off. With the launch of the new slogan, Fletcher became comfortable and confident in his position at the fund and decided to permanently relocate to the New York area. He and Bernice, his second wife, began looking at houses in suburban New Jersey, but they found racial segregation as oppressive there as anywhere else. Realtor Ted Brunson found them a spacious three-bedroom Dutch colonial in, a, in the leafy suburb of Rutherford, but noted, quote, I don't know if I have done you any justice by inquiring into this house. I am well known in the town as a human rights activist, and as a black man, the price may have gone up, unquote. That summer, the Fletcher signed a three-year lease on a new apartment in Lincoln Plaza on the Upper West Side between Central Park and Lincoln Center, no less fashionable than their prior digs at Plaza 50, and still a comfortable 20-minute walk from the fund office. And Fletcher sought and won election to the steering committee of the National Urban Coalition, a civil rights organization based in New York. Fletcher continued traveling and raising money for the fund that spring, calling its member colleges, quote, a vital and indispensable national resource, unquote. He spoke in Raleigh and Cincinnati, keynoted the A Mind is a Terrible Thing to Waste campaign kickoff in Princeton, and was the main speaker at a fundraising event at San Antonio. He gave the commencement speech at Kent State University two years after the deadly shooting of student protesters there by members of the National Guard. Quote, minorities and women will not be excluded nor limited, unquote, he said. Quote, your generation should see to it that no stone is left unturned in sharing these job opportunities for those who were left out in the decades of the 50s and the 60s, unquote. He also wrote a successful $95,000 grant from the Luce Foundation for management training for the fund staff. In the summer, Fletcher secured a $2 million gift from a Richmond businessman for fund member institution Virginia Union University, quote, described as the largest single contribution ever presented, unquote, to the school. At a New Orleans convention of the Lynx, a charitable organization led by black women, Fletcher accepted their check for $68,000 for the fund, 
he announced the 11075 program, whereby one million blacks would each pledge $10 a year through 1975, adding that the nation needed to get beyond, quote, first nigger syndrome, unquote. In other words, to get beyond the first black person to hold a particular job. At the Republican Party's quadrennial convention, where Richard Nixon was nominated for a second term as president, Fletcher convinced the RNC Platform Committee to adopt a plank supporting historically black educational institutions. In the fall, Fletcher gave speeches for the fund in Kansas City, San Francisco, and St. Louis, and in the winter, he spoke in Oklahoma City and Miami. The total amount raised in 1972, one reporter noted, was $11.2 million which didn't quite meet the $12.5 million goal, but still represented, quote, an increase of nearly $2 million over the previous year. And then they fired him. I'm gonna pause there. Sort of a dramatic moment in his life story. And I go into two or three pages exploring the various, uh, the various reasons why he may have been fired, uh, which of course you'll, you'll need to get the book and read the book yourselves to delve into, but it, it's an important point about the work that we do as historians and the good work that uh, archives like the Dole Institute are so critical in helping us do. Uh, historians do not, um, uh, do not sort of pronounce the truth, uh, having read a whole bunch of books like the ones you see on, on the bookcases behind me, uh, become these learned folks who can just sort of pronounce the truth about the past. What we do, is uh, we conduct research, we gather evidence, and we draw appropriate conclusions based on the evidence that we have found. Uh, as a result, the work of history is constantly uh, being rewritten, uh, being revised, um, and this work on Arthur Fletcher, I, would, I could only hope will be revised by future historians who have uncovered additional uh, information and can draw better conclusions than I. Um, but this is a sort of a case in point that I talk about with my students. Uh, in fact, I got a question from a student a, a week ago about this very point. Um, why was Arthur Fletcher fired from the United Negro College Fund? Let's explore the possibilities. And I have no definitive answer, um, but Vernon Jordan is still very much with us. And if he happens to be tuning in, I'd love a phone call. <laughs> um, maybe he can shed some further light on it. Uh, and I'll um, conclude this portion of, uh, of the reading. Um, I'm going to go forward to the end of chapter five. And again, the process of being a historian, um, I think you can tell I love doing what I do. Um, but uh, just to talk a little bit about about process and the great heights that, uh, of emotion that you can feel. I wrote this next passage fairly early in this work. So this was a, a nearly decade long project for me. I wrote this passage uh, probably about six or seven years ago. And I just remember how proud I was of this passage uh, because it just sort of summed up um, so much that I had learned about Arthur Fletcher at this point in his life, which is at the very end of the 1970s. Um, and uh, I only had to tinker with it just a little bit as more evidence came in, as, as more documents uh, became available to me, uh, especially, by the way, the Arthur Fletcher papers. And I'd like to take this moment, by the way, to thank Paul Fletcher, uh, Arthur Fletcher's surviving son, who has the Arthur Fletcher papers in hard copy down where he lives in Hollywood, Florida. Um, and uh, we will be working in the months to come to, uh, to get the digital copies housed at uh, the Maybe Library at Washburn University uh, in Topeka, just a little bit down the road from the Dole Institute. So this final passage from chapter five, the very end of the 1970s. In his final months with the Nixon administration, his sights set on a political career back in Washington state, Arthur Fletcher had hoped that the 1970s would be a time of consolidation of the nation as a post-Jim Crow land of equal opportunity, the ghettos disappearing in the wake of good jobs and fair housing, of the Republican Party as an interracial big tent led by men like Nelson Rockefeller, George Bush, and Edward Brooke, and of his own career as a rising star and role model for both. It was his drive for consolidation in these areas, as much as serendipity and luck, that called him to lead the United Negro College Fund, 
work at the Republican National Committee, publish The Silent Sellout, his account of his time in the Nixon administration, develop his affirmative action consulting business, and the Society for Victorious Living, a religious organization that he founded, challenge Kissinger's unconscious racism, campaign tirelessly for Ford's election, deliver the speech of his career at the 1976 Republican National Convention, and run for RNC chairman in 1977 and mayor of Washington, D.C. in 1978. Although the party was racing away from what Fletcher stood for much faster than he could keep up, it didn't shake his faith the way one might expect. This wasn't naivete. Rather, Fletcher held fast to his principles and believed that he could still pull the GOP in a more productive direction. In all three of his goals, however, the decade proved disappointing. Continued inequality and poverty, as well as the decline of the cities, developed in tandem with a racial backlash, leading unreconstructed Southerners and Northern white working class voters into the Republican Party. The conservatives seemed ascendant. The fund fired him, the Society for Victorious Living fizzled, and Ford lost to Carter. In 1979, Nelson Rockefeller was dead, Edward Brooke was out of office, Marion Barry was the mayor of Washington, and Fletcher's book was out of print. There were plenty of things that kept Arthur Fletcher up at night in 1979, but he did have one cause for hope. In George Bush, he saw a panacea. Here was a man who, like Fletcher, spent the 1970s working to consolidate his goals for the nation, the party, and his own career. Here, was an experienced leader and skilled politician, a civil rights moderate and fiscal conservative who combined a Northeast establishment upbringing with a Texan's charm and who had proven experience bridging the two sides of the Republican Party. At the United Nations and the Republican National Committee, Fletcher and Bush had become friends. Now, after enduring his own roller coaster ride in the 1970s, George Bush was running for president. So what I'd like to do is stop there. Uh, incidentally, the chapter that follows is called Bush for President, 1980 to 1989, and uh, covers the, the very first uh, Bush uh, presidential campaign in 1980 through, the, through Bush's victorious campaign in 1989, and of course, Fletcher's role in all of this. Um, and I'd like to go ahead and see if there is a feed of questions or comments that I can address. from the Facebook page. See all. Just so you all know, uh, the Facebook page is about 20 seconds behind me. It's just the nature of Facebook, I'm told. And so I can see myself saying the last thing I said to you all as I look at the Facebook page, but I'm not uh, seeing where I will find the feed of questions. So I'm gonna ask Zach if he can help at this point, by, uh, and there may be no questions uh, about Arthur Fletcher yet. Um, but Zach, can you give us a hand here and, uh, Show me where this feed is, where I might find some questions or comments about Arthur Fletcher and a terrible thing to waste. I pasted a link there in chat. Ah, okay. Thank you, I'm clicking on the link. And I just I hope I don't hear myself talking 20 seconds after. I see three comments. Here we are. Okay. So we have three comments um, and I certainly appreciate them. Uh, from those of you who have sent them, uh, could someone post a question uh, about um, 
Arthur Fletcher or the book in particular, or uh, what it's like to be a professor of history, to be working as a professional um, uh, historian. And I do have, all right, a question has just popped up. Please talk about the most fun part of doing the research. This question actually, um, since we've been in this uh, COVID-19 environment and we have been, uh, those of us who can, we have been working from home and I've certainly been working from home. Um, I've now been posting some questions that are asked by my students uh, on the Blackboard course shell that I have for each of my classes. And this question just came up from a student um, earlier this week. Uh, I was asked about the, the thing that I like the most about doing the research and the thing that I like the least. Um, the, what I like the most about doing historical research, frankly, is the travel. We do an awful lot of travel to archives. Um, uh, this, you know, this may change in the future, and I think um, COVID-19 may be a herald of how things will be changing going forward for how um, archival research is conducted. And I think that'll, um, that'll certainly equalize things because not everybody can, can be fortunate enough to have the funds available to do the travel. Um, but for me, I have just loved being on the road. Uh, I, I've been, a prof since college really, I've been a professional historian. So that's about uh, a little over 20 years now. And um, I remember, in fact, one of my first dates with my wife was we were in college and I, uh, I needed to go do some research at the American Antiquarian Society up in Worcester, Mass. And we were in New York City at the time. And uh, so we drove up. Um, I, I borrowed, must have borrowed someone's car. I doubt that I owned a car at the time. And we drove up to Worcester and she went to a few museums and I went and I did my research up there at the American Antiquarian. And, um, just being out on the road, the wind in your hair, uh, it's kind of like the classic American ideal, right? Uh, in fact, when I was in Kansas uh, doing research at Fort Riley and at Washburn and at uh, the Brown, uh, I forget if it's called the Brown Institute or the Brown Center, uh, but it's the schoolhouse for Brown versus Board um, uh, where uh, Ms. Brown now, or at least when I was there a decade ago, Ms. Brown was running the center and it was sort of a museum of the Brown v. Board case. Um, I, I got a, a, an accidental free upgrade at the airport for a rental car. They didn't have the, the cheapy version that I had requested. Um, I came in late on the flight and there were, there were only just a couple of cars left. And so they gave me this red uh, Mustang convertible. Uh, so there I was driving around Kansas in a red Mustang convertible from, uh, you know, from Lawrence to Topeka to um, to Junction City and back, and um, with Mark Peterson in tow, the chair of political, longtime chair of political science uh, at Washburn, who had uh, interviewed Art Fletcher back in 2003 with his colleagues there. Uh, what a lot of fun that was! And the other part of it is, uh, you know, I enjoy eating. Well, gosh, who doesn't? But I mean, I really love different types of food. And um, I was telling my students today when I was filming some videos for them that the other part of the travel to do research is you should be sampling local cuisine um, if you're omnivorous as I am. And I was remembering when I, uh, I guess the most recent uh, research trip I took uh, on this project was probably about three years ago now, went down to Little Rock to the Bill Clinton uh, archive. Uh, William Clinton Presidential Archive. And so of course I had Arkansas barbecue. You know, what else are you gonna do when you're in, um, when you're in Little Rock is get some good barbecue. And what a pleasure that was. So that's certainly my most favorite thing. And I see Zach is just typing in questions. I don't know whether they're from Zach or whether he's found them somewhere that I can't find them. And he's gonna go ahead and type them to me in the, in the sidebar here. But what made you choose to write about Arthur Fletcher out of all the civil rights leaders? Great question. Thank you. Uh, he, I, I quote unquote discovered him. I, I hate to say that actually now that I think about it. It's kind of like Columbus showing up and you know he meets the local uh, folks and he says congratulations you've been discovered. Uh, you know, life doesn't really work that way. But for me personally I discovered Art Fletcher in my own life when I was working on my dissertation in graduate school in the 2000s. Um, and this would have been, as I became a candidate for the, for the doctorate, it probably would have been around 2005, 2006. Unfortunately, just a little too late to actually meet Art and talk to him uh, because he died in July of 2005. 
but I was working on my dissertation on the Philadelphia plan on the origins of affirmative action in the building construction trades, which uh, since became my first book, which is also over my uh, right shoulder. It's the one with the white um, cover. Uh, Constructing affirmative action is what it's called. And um, there's Arthur Fletcher, this larger than life, blustery ex football player. Uh, he just, every, every scholarly archival corner I turned, there he was kind of staring at me. And um, as I say in the acknowledgments to this latest book, uh, as I was working on the dissertation, I had a meeting with um, my second reader, uh, who was uh, and still is um, uh, Professor Joshua Freeman. Um, of the City University of New York Grad Center and Queens College. And we were talking about it, and I just kept talking about Art Fletcher, Art Fletcher, Art Fletcher. And, uh, and he said, well, why don't you just do your dissertation on Art Fletcher? And I paused for a moment and thought about it. And I was already so far along with the overall project at that time, again, origins of affirmative action, that um, I, I, what I, my answer was maybe for the second book. And it was uh, half joking because um, the vagaries of the professorial job market are such that you cannot, as a grad student, expect anymore to become a professor of history and therefore have the wherewithal to do this sort of thing and to have the opportunity um, to write a second book. And, um, and yet, uh, I always had it in the back of my head at that point. And when I did get a tenured, a tenured track position, which has since become a tenured post and a now a full professorship, I was able, uh, I had the good fortune to be able to pursue that second project. Um, and uh, let me say, while I'm on that subject, I just want to thank Governor State University, uh, GSU um, uh, in University Park, Illinois. This has been my academic home for the past, nearly the past decade, for nine years now. What a wonderful place it has been to teach and to study and to work and um, how grateful I am to the faculty and the staff and the administration and the students of Governor State University for um, allowing me to do that these past nine years. I'm looking forward to the next nine. Uh, how contentious was the relationship between Fletcher and Kissinger is a question that just came in. Um, it flared up uh, initially and then it seems to have calmed down is the answer. Uh, there was, uh, I think it was an NAACP convention in Boston that Fletcher was speaking at, and so was Kissinger. And I guess this, this would have been while Fletcher was with the Ford administration. Uh, so that would have been in calendar 1976. Uh, I think probably this was in August of 76. And uh, it may have been July now that I think of it, because the NAACP conventions tended to be in July uh, maybe the news articles about this came out in August, which is why August is popping into my head. Uh, basically, the story goes that uh, Kissinger, um, at the time, he was Secretary of State, and there were uh, a limited number of elevator banks in this grand hotel where this meeting was taking place, and apparently Kissinger reserved uh, one of them or two of them just for his own use. Um, and, uh, and remember, this is the NAACP convention. This is not Kissinger's personal convention. And so that resulted in there being an awful lot of unhappy uh, conventioneers uh, at this event. Uh, people wanted to go upstairs and get changed for the next, um, the next event as the evening wore on. They're getting ready to go to dinner and go to cocktail parties, perhaps get changed, get freshened up. And there's lines all through the lobby for these elevators because Kissinger has taken over a couple of them. Uh, or at least one, and um, created the situation. And so when they ended up on a panel together, um, uh, Kissinger must have said something. Uh, I think he's, uh, he was asked, if I recall correctly, um, how come there aren't any African Americans working for you in the State Department? I think it may have been at the senior levels of the State Department. Um, and Kissinger said something really insulting uh, to the assembled audience. And we should take it, all of us should find it insulting, frankly. He just said, oh, only the best and the brightest can work at the State Department, as if African Americans aren't part of the best and brightest, um, which is uh, for, I hope it's ridiculous on its face to say such a thing. Uh, at any rate, um, uh, Fletcher then said something negative, um, blocking on exactly what it was. Um, 
he, he sort of, uh, he said, well, perhaps we shouldn't be taking over elevators for our own personal use, uh, something along those lines, and the press picked up on that. Um, but he definitely, Fletcher definitely did hone in on the issue, and he said, uh, you know, there's, uh, what you should have done before you got here, Mr. Secretary, was, um, I think he may have actually had to say this to Rockefeller, because they called him onto the carpet when he got back to the White House. That is, they called Fletcher onto the carpet. And um, he wasn't having any of it. He said to the vice president, look, you can't call me onto the carpet just for saying it like it is, uh, <laughs> which is one of the things I love about the story of Arthur Fletcher, because he will just say it like it is. He doesn't want you to read between the lines. He puts it right on the line every single time. He's not trying to hide anything. And so uh, here it is like it is. Um, if Kissinger had brought some of his African-American assistants to that convention like he should have, they would have told him not to take one of those elevators and not to make that stupid comment. Um, uh, at that panel. And um, uh, the next time apparently they saw each other, uh, Kissinger took a moment to, to say to Art, uh, look at all these African American um, assistants that I brought with me, um, which again in and of itself shows sort of a, uh, a lack of well, heck, hey, if Kissinger is tuning in, go ahead and ask a question or call me up, uh, Kissinger. I know you're still with us, um, but so I'd love to hear it from the horse's mouth, as it were, but um, uh, just sort of the notion that uh, the tokenism and uh, having a few African-American uh, advisors with you should solve all the problems is kind of the, the problem in and of itself. Uh, but they seem to have gotten along all right uh, after that point. Um, okay, I have a question from Aaron Cressy. Did I tell the Ted Bundy story? I mentioned Ted Bundy early today uh, in, in regards to it uh, in the first three pages when I talk about the overarching arc of Fletcher's life and how as he was campaigning for Lieutenant Governor in Washington State, uh, his driver and bodyguard <clears throat> was a young college Republican, uh, none other than uh, future serial killer Ted Bundy. Uh, and yes, that's true. Absolutely. It's been um, corroborated by multiple sources, uh, including um, longtime family friend and uh, adoptive daughter, Kathy Kelker, who is probably tuning in right now um, uh, from her home near Seattle, uh, who grew up in, in and around the Fletcher household um, in Pasco, Washington, uh, back in the late 1960s. Yeah, there was this clean-cut kid, as Paul Fletcher describes him, a, a clean-cut yuppie and penny loafers, um, who, uh, who, because of his connections to the Republican Party and various college groups, got himself attached to Art Fletcher in 1968 as his driver. Um, and uh, uh, the story is that he wanted to have permission to uh, carry a gun, and that Fletcher vetoed it but I have it on good authority that he went ahead and carried one anyway, which uh, gosh, sounds like Ted Bundy, if you think about it. Um, so uh, yeah, um, and slept outside. Another, another side of the story is that he would sleep outside Art's bedroom door uh, like a guard dog. Uh, if you can imagine Ted Bundy, um, and I guess, you know, it, it's fairly easy to imagine that. Uh, Ted Bundy curled up outside of Fletcher's door. The fact is Fletcher was getting death threats during the 1968 campaign for Lieutenant Governor of Washington State. He had won the Republican nomination. In fact, he won every single county in the primary. Um, uh, and uh, uh, he was getting death threats, uh, as I think I put it in the book, from both the left and from the right. He was called an Uncle Tom, and he got all sorts of uh, midnight phone calls with people calling him the N-word, um, uh, presumably from, uh, from uh, white racist, white superior, white nationalist groups uh, at the time. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, I have another question that's come up. Joan J. Maloney asks, what inspired you to become a historian? Thanks, Joan. Um, yeah, so I, it, it had always been my favorite academic subject in high school. And growing up, my mom lined the bookshelves all around the house with history books. Um, my dad had the books, the great ideas books, right? Um, but my mom loved history. And so as a kid, and um, I didn't, I wasn't allowed to watch much television as a child. And uh, uh, did, we didn't really even have one in the living room 
for most of my childhood. So I would just spend hour after hour after hour. I mean, I would get home from school on a Friday and I would probably read three books by the time I started school again on a Monday morning. Um, and the classics, but also very much history. And so I really enjoyed history um, in K-12 and especially in high school. In fact, it was the only AP course that I took when I was in high school. But that's not what I wanted to do at the time. So I, you know, it was a lot of fun and I did, I, you know, I did as well as uh, on, on average as I did as a high school student, which was not particularly well at that point in my life. But I focused on my career goal at the time, which was to be uh, the next Elvis Presley. I wanted to be a rock and roll star. And that became, I want to be an opera singer. And then that became, I want to be a Broadway actor. Um, and finally, when I was about 27, I realized that I wasn't going to be any of those things and decided to go to college. And when I was in college, of course, I decided to major in what had been my favorite academic subject. And then at some point in the first year, Professor Myrna Chase of Baruch College, City University of New York, came up to me after class and she said, well, David, we've really got to sit down and talk at some point because you're actually really good at this. And I don't know how many of those conversations she had over the years. It's a very small handful of people who come out of, um, uh, of Baruch College, which is mainly a business college, to become professional historians. Um, uh, James Oakes is another example of a Baruch College undergrad who went on to become a professional historian. Uh, but um, we had that conversation, and I learned what the path was to get, to get into graduate school and to do the graduate work, and um, I got into a top-tier grad school, University of Virginia. Um, didn't particularly like it that much, but it was because of the long-distance thing from loved ones at that point, and ultimately went back to New York. Um, and so that's how I got into, I got into history. Uh, Abby Woody asks, do you believe Fletcher's football and military career had an impact on his political career? If so, how? Absolutely. Fletcher was a team player. And while I'm at it, let me thank Hillel Swiller and Phil Luloff of the Mount Sinai Retired Psychiatrists Reading Group. Uh, they've given me a great number of um, insights over the years into psychology. In particular, if you're a biographer, you need to know a little something about psychology so you can uh, sort of <laughs> psychoanalyze your subject. Um, but one of the things that I got out of reading for that group uh, was that Arthur Fletcher was a team player. Uh, and he became a team player initially as a military brat and as a high school football, basketball, and track player. Literally a team player in that sense. And then in the military, of course, being uh, a team player is sort of drilled into you. You have to follow orders. You have to do what is expected of you. Lives depend on it. Um, and, but that ethos continued with him into his college and his brief professional football career. Why does that matter as a politician? In particular for Arthur Fletcher, it matters because he never left the Republican Party because it was his team. He, he didn't contemplate leaving the Republican Party. That was his team. That was his group. In a sense, that was his army, uh, to continue with that military metaphor. Uh, and so he resolved to try to make the Republican Party better, or uh, to put a finer point on it, to slow down and reverse the trends that he disliked about the Republican Party, which is that the party was getting away from its foundational principles of civil rights that it had held uh, since the days of Lincoln. Uh, so that absolutely uh, helped him, uh, it, or helped him th with the decisions that he had to make. Uh, in the political arena. As for the, um, uh, there's a follow-up. Can you talk a little bit about the end of Fletcher's career with the United Negro College Fund? Sure. And, uh, and you know, students, we talked a little bit about this uh, last week. So there, I pose a number of possibilities in the book for why he was fired. Um, uh, he may not have been hired with the best of intentions by the people who hired him. There may have been a sense that he would be a stopgap executive director. And indeed, Mary Beth Gassman's history of the United Negro College Fund doesn't even refer to Arthur Fletcher, although he appears in the footnotes um, to her book, The End Notes. She talks about an interim executive director uh, during the um, year and a quarter in which Art Fletcher held that post 
um, and doesn't mention by name, as I said. Uh, so um, it may have just been a waiting game for the people who ultimately hired him, Vernon Jordan among them. Oh, I've got a text. I wonder if Vernon Jordan or Henry Kissinger is trying to get a hold of me. And no, <laughs> it's, it's neither of them. Uh, um, uh, so that was one possibility. Uh, you know, uh, what, what Fletcher thought at various times and has come out in conversations with other members of the family was that uh, his staunch Republicanness, um, that is, uh, the vice president at the time, Spiro Agnew, was becoming, had become something of a bete noire of the left and of uh, sophisticated circles um, uh, and the sort of circles in which uh, the college presidents of the United Negro College Fund ran. And uh, Fletcher arranged for Agnew to be the keynote speaker for the April 1972 um, gala of the United Negro College Fund. Um, and so that may have been something of a last straw for people who are already trying to get rid of him. Uh, in addition, as I, I mentioned in the reading, in the portion that I did read uh, from the book from that period, uh, the the college presidents may have had some of their feathers ruffled, as it were, uh, when it came to the launching of the phrase, of the catchphrase, the slogan, a mind is a terrible thing to waste. Uh, if you've never heard it before, um, and you're a position of authority within the fund, it may sound like something you'd want to oppose. We all now, almost 50 years on, it's become so ingrained in our culture that um, we can't imagine it being anything other than what it is, and it doesn't sound negative at all to us. Uh, and yet at the time, some of the college presidents had some difficulty with it, and uh, the larger difficulty was that he had gone ahead and launched it without having a longer discussion with them. Uh, but ultimately, as I conclude in the book, he was uh, an ideas politics man, person, uh, and the fund at that time was transitioning from a 10, 11, 12 million dollar a year cocktail party foundation to a major, major complicated, complex fundraising um, regime, which would need uh, an awful lot of bureaucracy. They were about to launch into direct mail uh, types of contributions. And so what they needed was someone who could uh, have a bureaucratic touch and who could manage a staff, a very large and complicated staff, uh, which is what the fund ultimately became and, and remains today. Um, and that really wasn't Fletcher's forte. He was about smiling and giving good speeches and thinking about the big picture. And so they went with Chris Edley, who I think they got him from the Ford Foundation, but he was sort of really the right person for the job at that time. Um, okay, I see that, uh, any further questions? I see that the, they haven't been, no more have been added into the feed that I'm getting in the group chat that Zach is, is forwarding. Zach, is there any, are there any other questions? Hey folks out there, go ahead and ask your questions, um, and Zach will, uh, Zach will send them to me so I can read them. Uh, I have a question from Kathy Kolker. Uh, hi David, yes I'm watching. Glad to hear it, Kathy. Hope you're doing well. Um, and I'm so happy you wrote this book about my adopted dad. She encourages everyone to buy it. Fascinating, inspiring man who had so many obstacles. Never gave up trying to make a difference. Even though I lived through much of his story, your research was so thorough that I learned some things I, do, I didn't know about. Great job. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kathy. You know, um, that was when I talk about my favorite things that I do as a historian. I mean, that's yet another example. Um, I was on a family trip a couple years back. The book was in its very final stages and um, uh, of editing at that point, uh, but I hadn't met Kathy, uh, the adopted daughter of Arthur and Bernice Fletcher. Um, and, uh, and she, I think her, the town she lives in now, I think is Renton. You've been the, you're the former mayor of Renton, Kathy, and I think your political career was to a great ex extent inspired by art. Um, and uh, it was such a pleasure to meet you uh, and the other folks that I met uh, on that family vacation a couple years back when we went up to the to the Pacific Northwest. So thank you, Kathy. Um, I have a question from uh, Jamelia Hand. Uh, Mr. Fletcher had several traumatic personal experiences. How do you believe? How do you believe those helped to shape or influence his unique position/slash perspective? Yeah. Um, 
I mean, uh, the two main areas of Fletcher's life that he had to overcome uh, in terms of traumatic experiences were that very early he got uh, my, my dad, the psychologist would call this good enough parenting. Um, he got good enough parenting from his mother, uh, but, he, but it could have been a lot better. Um, we can't cast too, too much blame on her. She was a single mom who did the best she could under very, very difficult circumstances in 1920s and 1930s um, uh, Arizona and Los Angeles and other parts of the Southwest. Um, the other one uh, really was uh, with the suicide of his first wife. And um, that, that also resulted in the disintegration of his family. And there are so many stories that have come out of that that have been really, really important for me to learn, only some of which could be included in a book, which was ultimately about Art Fletcher and, and not the story of others. Um, <clears throat> for Fletcher, for Art Fletcher, when he suddenly became a single father, that was huge in his understanding of what the vast majority of African Americans were uh, going through at that time, which is not to say the vast majority of African Americans are raised in single parent homes, that's not correct. But the vast majority of African Americans were not, had not been able to attain a college education the way he had. And even though he faced incredible adversity as a college grad trying to get the sort of appropriate work for college graduates, um, he perhaps didn't quite understand life for most African Americans in the early 1960s until that happened to him. Um, didn't just happen to him. I mean, again, it happened to his entire family. And most importantly, of course, it happened to his wife. Uh, the first victim of suicide is the person who commits suicide, of course. Um, but then he was able to get that understanding. He became, he became a single father, often unable to make the rent, underemployed. And it was from there, I call that chapter, which basically begins in the aftermath of his wife's suicide and concludes with his appointment as Assistant Secretary of Labor in the Nixon administration. I call that chapter Moonshot, because at the same time as the United States is getting ready to get on the moon uh, and to take its literal moonshot in July 1969, incidentally, the month in which Governor State University was founded, uh, Arthur Fletcher is preparing for his moonshot. He is putting together the entirety of the experiences of his first the first half of his life and cobbling together somehow um, a national, what will become a national profile. Um, and so uh, absolutely trauma truly informed who he was. Um, let's see. Uh, and Aaron Cressy asked, did Fletcher ever interact with Bob Dole? Well, we are here at the Bob Dole Institute. I mean, this is not the Bob Dole Institute. We are here virtually at the Bob Dole Institute uh, for politics. And yes, he absolutely did. In fact, I think the cover photo for this particular session before it became my uh, ugly face in front of these, uh, these beautiful books was a picture of Ed Brook, Art Fletcher, and yes, Bob Dole. Um, from the look of it, uh, it looks like early 1970s. Um, and uh, Ed Brooks, senator from Massachusetts, um, himself as well, a World War II veteran and a Republican. Uh, certainly Fletcher interacted with Bob Dole. We don't have any, I couldn't find any evidence at the Dole archive or in the Fletcher papers either that they had had any interaction before Fletcher made it into the Nixon administration. Uh, but I have a few documents that, uh, where they exchanged um, at least pleasantries, I can't remember the exact nature of the documents, while Fletcher was working for Nixon. Um, and certainly in 1976, uh, Arthur Fletcher gave a very important, I call it the speech of his life, he gave a seconding speech, seconding the nomination of Bob Dole uh, uh, as a vice presidential nominee um, in 1976 uh, at the RNC in, well, gosh, I think it was in Kansas City. Uh, if I recall correctly, the 1976 Republican National Convention. Uh, Kevin Magruder asks, have you received feedback on the book from contemporary Black Republicans? Um, I have received 
uh, feed, I do not know. Um, the, I guess that's the short answer. The, the two reviews that have been published so far, um, I don't know whether they are published by whites or African Americans, and I don't know whether they're published by Democrats or Republicans or other. Um, I will say that uh, the HNET review, which um, was delightful to read uh, because it was written by a member of the Federalist Society, uh, if indeed that person was African American, I would assume he's an African American Republican, uh, but I don't know the race of that writer. Um, he took me to task uh, and I, I highly recommend everyone read the HNET review. Most importantly, uh, as my dean, Andre Marek, pointed out some months ago, it's doing what, uh, it points out that the book is doing what we want it to do, what I want it to do, um, uh, which is it is causing people to argue about what it is to be a black Republican and the direction of the Republican Party uh, historically for the past half century. Um, but I'd, I'd love to, and I hope I hope to hear from more um, African American Republicans. Uh, of course, um, Paul Fletcher and I have continued to have conversations uh, about the book. Um, I think another question popped up, and it looks like we're heading into four o'clock. And uh, I've uh, uh, and so I'd like to wrap up by once again thanking you all for tuning in virtually, joining us here at the uh, Robert Dole Institute uh, for Politics in. Uh, Lawrence, Kansas, at the uh, campus of the University of Kansas. Thank you all for tuning in to hear me talk about Arthur Fletcher. Um, and, uh, and it's just been a great hour. It's been a great time spending some time with you all. Thank you. <laughs>